Good evening, everybody, and welcome back to 2020. Um, I want to remind you before we get too far into this that uh, there are still some New Testaments left in the box back there that Charlie left this morning. Um, we'd like to see all of those go, wouldn't we? I'd like to see uh, you take, um, take all those one at a time. You know, don't take a whole bunch. Do take, but I think Brother Charlie wants to each person to take one and give one out. If you need another one, come back and get another one and hand it out and do that until they're gone then we can maybe get some more. But that, that's, a, that's a great thing. So I appreciate what the Gideons do and what Charlie does with them as well. Okay, the question for tonight is this. Would you discuss the gift of tongues? Some folks believe, it, believe to be saved, you must have experienced all of the spiritual gifts, especially speaking in tongues. That question, I normally don't give the name of who uh, uh, asked the question, but this one was from Sue Cordell, one of the last questions she's asked. And, and I didn't get to it in time, but she knows the answer now. You know, she knows more about it than any of us do. But she, she did ask a lot of questions and kept us going in 2020. So this is, this is continuing, okay? So speaking in tongues, what does the Bible say about speaking in tongues? Well, uh, I'm going to ask you to turn to several passages of Scripture. First, I'm going to ask you to turn to Genesis chapter 11, Genesis chapter 11, and then also Acts chapter 2, and then 1 Corinthians 14. Those three passages of Scripture. There are other passages that talk about it, but those are the three that we're going to talk about tonight if we have time. We're short on time tonight because we are doing communion tonight. But Genesis 11, Acts 2, 1 Corinthians 14. In Genesis chapter 11, the word Genesis means beginnings. That's where you see the beginning of a whole lot of things in Scripture. It, it, that's the seed book of the Bible. Everything begins there, in the beginning, which is a very good place to start. As you remember, that's what Julie Andrews sang in Sound of Music, right? We'll start at the very beginning. Genesis chapter 11 is the, the first time we see the gift of tongues mentioned in Scripture. Did you know that? A lot of people think it's Acts chapter 2, but it's not. It's Genesis chapter 11. It's at the Tower of Babel. In verse 6, and the Lord said, Behold, the people is one, and they have all one language, and this they begin to do. Their language, that they may not understand one, another, one, another, one another's speech. Just like that. See? That's how it works. So the Lord scattered them abroad from thence upon the face of all the earth, and they left off to build the city. Therefore is the name of it called Babel, because the Lord did there confound the language of all the earth, and from thence did the Lord scatter them abroad upon the face of all the earth. So these people were, were attempting to build a tower whose top may reach into heaven. What, what they're trying to do is, is supplant God, kind of throw God out of the picture, do everything them, themselves. Uh, it was the first time man realized that if if he got together, if man put his mind to do something and they did it together all as one, there's nothing they could not do and they don't need God. That is where they were in Genesis chapter 11. That is where the world is heading now. Same thing. You're, going to, you're, you're continuing to see all the people of the world gather together just like John Lennon tried to teach us in the song Imagine, right? That's the philosophy I used to hold when John Lennon wrote the song Imagine, until I became a Christian, then I realized, hey, that's an ungodly thought. That's not the way God planned it, not to do those things without him. But that, here in the, at the Tower of Babel, that is what the plan was. So God says, okay, let's, let's do something about this. Let's go and break this up. Let's, let's do it. How can we do this? Well, he could have split the ground under him and put this group on a, on a floating island over that way and another group on a floating island that way, another group on a floating island, just split them all up that way. No, that's not what he did. Uh, well, maybe a little bit. Well, that's another topic for another time. But what he did was he confounded their language. What happened was the guy on the top of the scaffold up there laying the, laying the brick on the top level says, hollered down and says, hey, I need some more bricks and mortar. The guy below him hollered down to the guy below him. He said, what do you say? And the guy below him said, what would you say? And none of them could understand each other. All of a sudden, the guy on the top row was speaking Russian. The guy in the middle was speaking Swahili. The guy below him was speaking Urdu. 
I don't know what they were speaking, but all speaking different languages. God gave them instantly the ability to speak a language they had never learned in their life. That is what the gift of tongues is. Okay? That is where it began. We do things by the book here at Crossroads Baptist Church. What the Bible says is what we go by, not by what experience teaches or what some other religion teaches. This is what the Bible teaches. This gift of tongues is for a specific purpose. It has been corrupted by those who want to use it for their own benefit. We are looking at reason and scripture here tonight, not emotion. Most churches teach this on the basis of emotion and experience. But that is not what the Bible teaches. The next time we see this happen is in Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2. If you're there, you'll see this, verse 1. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they, that is the disciples, were all with one accord in one place. Isn't this kind of what happened at the Tower of Babel? All the people of the earth were gathered with one accord in one place. For what purpose? Well, their own purpose, right? To glorify themselves, to glorify mankind. In Acts chapter 2, they were all with one accord in one place for a different purpose, and that was to glorify God, not themselves, okay? This is the day that the Lord spoke of when he told the disciples in the previous chapter, ye shall stay at Jerusalem until the power of the Lord come upon you, until the power of God come upon you, okay? Here's where it happens. And suddenly, verse 2, there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind. Does it mean it was a windy room? Doesn't mean a big gust of air came in through the window. A sound as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. The sound did, okay? Not wind, the sound did. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire. This was not flames on each of their head, as you see pictured in a lot of places. We're not reading what's written, (laughs) but it says cloven tongues as of fire. We don't know exactly what that was, but it, it shimmered on top of them like fire. Doesn't mean it was fire. And it sat upon each of them. And verse 4 says, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with what? What is that? Other tongues, right? Other tongues. Now, what is being taught by churches today that the gift of tongues is? It's not other tongues. They teach what what they like to say, unknown tongues. Languages that nobody has ever heard before. They call it a heavenly language, okay? God's language or what is spoken in heaven or something similar to that. I call it, here's a technical term for you, a very, very theological term. You already know, some of you heard me say it before. You might want to write this down. It's a very deep theological term, several syllables. You might want to look it up in Webster's later on or on Wikipedia. It's gobbledygook, okay? That is what you hear when you go to a charismatic tongue-speaking service. I've been in them, okay? Some churches teach you how to speak in tongues. They get you to practice it. They think you need to have the gift of tongues. They, They think you're not really a Christian until you have the gift of tongues. Not all churches teach that, but many of them do. And there are Christians who feel like, We are unsaved Baptists because we don't speak in tongues. That we're not godly because we don't speak in tongues. Do you know that down through history, there have been countless accounts of tribes, of people all around the world in backwaters of civilization, if they were civilized at all, who speak tongues like the Pentecostals do fluently. I mean, they speak it all the time. Do you know that there are numerous, hundreds of instances where people who were demon-possessed spoke in tongues? It is not evidence of the Holy Spirit. What we see here, when the gift of tongues is given, they spoke with other tongues, other tongues. That is foreign languages. And if you don't believe me, look at the following verses. It, it, It explains who was there. It says, they, the 120 disciples, including the apostles, Acts 1.15, 
uh, they were meeting together for a church service. They were filled with the Holy Spirit. And you see the people that were there, that gathered there listed uh, in verses 5 through 11. And there were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews, devout men out of every nation under heaven. Okay, they're all Jews, but different, different uh, nations. Okay, so even though they were Jewish, they spoke different languages. Just like uh, many Jews in Israel today speak Hebrew, uh, that's the national language. Uh, but there are more Jews in America than there are in Israel. They speak English primarily. And there are many who also speak Yiddish or Hebrew or other things as well. And then wherever you find Jews around the world, a, few, a number of years ago, there was a large Jewish Russian community over um, across from the DCSC, which is not called the DCSC anymore. But in fact, they, the, the, the apartment complex where the city put them doesn't even exist anymore. They raised it and built Afrocentric high school. But that location, that's where the, uh, the Russian Jewish community was. And I got to know some of them, and they, they spoke Russian. They're Jewish, you know, Orthodox Jews, but speaking Russian. So these are all Jewish people speaking different languages. And when this was noised about, verse 6, the multitude came together and were confounded because that every man heard them speak in his own language. And they were all amazed and marveled, saying one another, Behold, are not all these which speak Galileans? They're all from here. They speak one, one dialect, Hebrew or Aramaic. He says, And how hear we, every man in our own tongue, wherein we were born? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, the dwellers of Mesopotamia and in Judea and Cappadocia, in Pontus and Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt, the parts of Libya about Cyrene, and strangers of Rome, Jews and proselytes, Cretes and Arabians, we do hear them speak in our tongues, the wonderful works of God. Folks, don't let anybody con you into thinking that the gift of tongues, so-called, is unknown gobbledygook. What we term in, 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 in Greek, it's called glossolalia. It's, it's just guttural sounds that you make, nonsensical things that don't mean anything, and that is not what God gave as the gift of tongues, either in Genesis or in Acts chapter 2. Now, this, this has a tendency to get out of hand and always has um, because it is emotional for a lot of folks, experiential for a lot of folks. And so the Apostle Paul writes to the church at Corinth to correct their misuse of this gift. And the, the, the way this gift was given was definitely of God, not what you see today. But back then, if, if people truly had the gift of tongues today, and I don't believe the gift exists today, although it's possible God could give somebody the gift of tongues, the real gift of tongues, and send them to a, a foreign country to be a missionary and instantly give them the ability to speak that language without going to language school. They would instantly know that language. That's what the gift of tongues is. I've never seen that in hundreds of years of missionary history, the history of missions. Missions, missionaries have had to go to language school to learn the language, right? I'm not going to have time to go through the rules of the gift of tongues in 1 Corinthians 14, which is where you'll find it, but I will point this out. Six times in 1 Corinthians 14, Paul talks about unknown tongues. And the Pentecostals will point to that and say, see, there's unknown tongues right there, 1 Corinthians 14. I'm going to ask you to look at your Bible in 1 Corinthians 14, and everywhere you see the word unknown, six times it occurs there, you'll see it italicized. If you've got like a study Bible, that word is italicized in your text. Now, the translators of our Bible uh, did us the favor of letting us know when, when, when there was a word in Greek or in Hebrew that uh, they did, well, let's say it this way. If, it, if the passage was hard to translate or hard to understand if they translated it literally, sometimes they would add words into the text to make it easier for us to understand. And that's what they did in 1 Corinthians 14 on several occasions using the word unknown tongues. But that word unknown is italicized all six times to indicate that the word unknown is not in the Greek text. But what they're trying to get across is they're speaking a foreign language that no one has ever taught you before. It's unknown to you. Not known to, unknown to everybody, unknown to you because you never learned the language. And there are four rules given there for speaking in tongues. I'm not going to have, the buzzer's going to go off. I'm not going to have time to give you all four rules. 
But those rules are not being followed today by churches that teach and preach and use what they call the gift of tongues, which is another further indication they don't understand what the Bible teaches about tongues. Wow, how's that for timing? Let's go on with comments and questions and discussion. What are the four rules for the gift of tongues? <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. The four rules for speaking in tongues. Okay. Uh, first of all, when you speak in tongues, there should be uh, no more than two or three speaking the, uh, tongues in any church service. No more than two or three. Now, I can tell you that w the, the services that I've witnessed, uh, Pentecostal services, um, I, I was in one one time where just about everybody in the whole auditorium except me was speaking in what they called tongues. And quite, quite frankly, it was frightening to me. <laughs> I felt like it was in the midst of a whole bunch of demonically possessed people. Then they were all doing this. And, and not just making noises, but moving around and shaking and on the ground. And, and it, was, it was frightening. It really was. Uh, that's definitely not what is supposed to happen. Paul says no more than two or three at a time. Um, in fact, he says, he says no more than three are to speak in tongues in any one service, and that rule is constantly broken. Another one is they're supposed to be in order, that is not at the same time. And as I just described, all these folks were doing it at the same time numerous times. I mean, uh, not just that service, but all, all the, almost all the ones I witnessed. Uh, people are doing it at, at one time. They're talking over each other. One's doing it here, one's doing it there, one's doing it there, one's doing it there, all speaking in what they think is tongues all at the same time. That is unscriptural too. Paul says no more than two or three in order. One, first one, then another one, then another one, and then you're done. And then, now look, keep in mind, he's talking about the real gift of tongues. Okay? It was a real gift at that time. It was still in effect up until the end of the apostolic age. There was a gift of tongues. It did exist. I don't think it exists now. There, I have evidence for that. I, I, I can cover that another time. I'm, a, I'm a, what we call a cessationist <coughs> in that regard. I don't think there are signs and wonders and miracles and all those kinds of things uh, happen anymore. I, let me qualify that. Miracles do happen today. I've seen it, but I don't have the ability to make them happen. You don't have the ability to make them happen. God can do miracles, but people don't have that ability today. Back in the apostolic age, the apostles had abilities, spiritual gifts, that we do not have today. Even the shadow of the apostles could heal people if people passed through those shadows. You could see that in Scripture. The apostles could do things that we cannot do today. Once the apostles were, were dead and gone, that ability ceased. Okay? I don't have the ability to heal anybody or speak in tongues, and neither do you. The apostles could. They definitely could. Okay? So he said, when, get, when the gift was still in effect, he said no more than two or three in, en in any service, no matter how long the service is, no matter no more than two or three, one at a time. He says also, third rule, rule number three, if somebody speaks in tongues, there must be an interpreter present. And he explains it at length in that chapter. He says, what's the point in speaking in tongues, in, in, in speaking in a foreign language, if nobody can understand it? If you do that, you're doing it for your own glory, not God's glory. Just like I said a little bit ago. If there's no interpreter present to interpret the foreign language, just like at the United Nations, then why are you speaking in tongues? Does it glorify God? No. You're trying to feel good about the fact that you can speak in tongues. It's about you, not about God. And that's what I see today. When you see tongues being spoken, and, and, and folks will, will evangelize you for tongues as, as if, man, I speak in tongues. You should speak in tongues. Everybody should speak in tongues. You're not saved unless you speak in tongues. It's all about the flesh, okay? That's rule number three. Fourth rule, and you're not going to like this. Nobody ever does. Women are not to do it right there, black and white. I didn't say it, God said it, okay? He says women are not to do it. How often do you see that rule broken today? 
Huh? Yeah, every time they do it. In fact, it's rare for me to see a man speaking in tongues in a Pentecostal church service. It's almost always women. Okay? Not by rule. I'm reading what God wrote. We go by the book, capital B. It's not by rule. I'm just the messenger boy. So don't beat me about the head and shoulders. I'm just telling you what God, God said. Okay? But those are the four rules. No more than two or three. One at a time. Must be an interpreter and no women. If you, if you can handle all those rules, he says go for it. But remember, it's no longer in effect. When John died at the end of the first century, the gifts disappeared. Not all the spiritual gifts, but the sign gifts did. And the scripture to that you're referring to for these is all in? It's all in 1 Corinthians 14. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. This is more of a comment. I uh, cannot begin to thank you enough for uh, clearing a lot of that up because I was raised in one of those Pentecostal holiness churches back in the hills. And I always felt kind of bad because I never could speak in tongues. And I just, I thank you for clearing that up. No problem. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah, it is scary. It is. So this is, a, I was raised in the hills too, so I've seen a lot of this also. <laughs> so, uh, and I got in a lot of trouble with a lot of the, what the so-called pastors there who said, you know, you're not saved unless you speak in tongues. And then I would challenge them, as, so you're saying that you're, Christ wasn't, effort, Christ's sacrifice wasn't good enough is what you're saying. So you're adding this on to it. You know, I feel like churches that have added that on to it have really missed what salvation is. And I don't, I really have, have a real concern that they don't have salvation. I do too. I do too. If 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 it's they base a lot of stuff on works and experience and emotion. And that's always a scary thing. Thank you. Um we used to cook when I was a kid. Pray for me, pray for me, pray for me to speak in tongues. And then after we left, and uh, my we go to work, come home on the way home, go to work, and my husband said, "Do you want to visit this church, the Baptist church?" And I say, "No, I don't want to go Baptist church because they don't speak in tongues. They not said that what Apple Peter said." And then, and then one evening. On the way home, I told my husband, let's go visit this church. And we did. And uh, that time, Pastor Wick uh, was still here. And uh, I think it's 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. 2002. And then after we came and we went to the first service, and then after that, we stayed for second service. And after we left, and I say, sweetheart, I found a home. Mm. I'm sweeter. Very good. Oh. Very good. Anyone else? Jonathan, are you raising your hand? Are you raising your hand or are you just getting happy? <laughs> <laughs> okay. I have one. Uh, my experience is limited, but I found the same thing you did. A whole lot of running up and down the aisles at one church. A lot of, uh, what is the uh, Hebrew or Greek phrase in the Bible? Something about uh, Lamech Sabachthani? Mm-hmm. Okay, it sounded a lot like that. They, a lot of them would fall on that type of phrasing and uh, it seemed like they had learned a few words or some sounds. But that was me being judgmental. Also, it's an uh, ironic phrase for them to use. You know what it means. Remind me. It, it, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Yeah. 
So if they're running up and down the aisles saying that, it, it says a whole lot. It? Well, it might not have been the same words, but it sounded similar to that. Okay. But also, it seemed like uh, another apostolic church I went to four or five times, just every week preaching about Acts. I never got out of the book of Acts during the time I was there anyway. Do you, have you found that, that they focus mostly on? No, I haven't been in one long enough to know that. Okay. If you won't run me out, I'll tell you I never believed in tongues. <coughs> I'm pretty old, and I, uh, I've considered this, this uh, scripture quite often. But I was in not an apostolic church, but I was at another church, and I, uh, uh, I went down on the ground, and I started to speak. Uh, I, I felt this wonderful experience, and I uh, uh, was saying to that uh, an act of an end is to make a new thing. And afterwards, I, you know, I went and tried to get away and try to figure this out because I thought, that, what was that, tongues? What, what in the world was that? It was absolutely wonderful. I felt like I had a little, had, had gone to a little piece of heaven and felt the peace of, of Christ. And uh, uh, there was no commotion about it. There was nothing that, you know, went on in the church or nobody, I don't think, really, I was in the very, very back and mm-hmm. nobody, I don't think, too much notice. I had a person who prayed for me. But, uh, you know, so I don't know what to do with myself, but I do know what to do with God. Yeah. And I think God can do anything he wants. Yeah, that's And true. I think if he wants somebody to speak in tongues to give him glory, and, and when I, when I uh, examined myself to why, why God, I asked him, I says, why did you give me that gift? I didn't ask for it. I didn't, uh, I don't understand. And then I remembered that I was supposed to take care of And I thought, well, was I, I had surrendered in that uh, meeting to God. I had surrendered my life to him. And mm-hmm. um, I think he, 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 this, this thought came in my mind. He says, because you finally made me your king. And so I believe that, uh, you know, that I had a, a um, uh, well, if you want to call it a miraculous experience, that's fine with me. But, uh, 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 you, you know, I'm, I was amazed. <laughs> and I still am. But now I cannot say anymore that I do not believe that this does happen. I haven't done it. I haven't spoken tongues since, <laughs> but uh, I don't know if you would classify that as speaking in tongues. But let me tell you, it was heavenly. Hmm. Well, I'm going to I'm going to say something, and it's not directed at you. Okay. Um, I have no doubt that that people have had experiences like you just described. I have no doubt that Joseph Smith um, saw something odd in. I forget the name of the town, uh, in, up in upstate New York. Uh, he claimed it was an angel that uh, gave him directions to write down uh, a book called the Book of Mormon. Um, I'm sure that uh, Mohammed saw something odd uh, when he was in the, the Arabian Desert uh, and started Islam. Uh, there have been some really interesting experiences that are related by religious founders and their followers over the years. But I also know that the Bible teaches that uh, Satan appears as an angel of light and is perfectly capable of deceiving us still today as he did Eve in the Garden of Eden and does everything in his power to do so. The Apostle Paul himself warned us that if anybody, including an angel from heaven, gives you any other gospel than what God has, had given him, then that person was to be accursed. I believe that Satan tries to duplicate what God is doing, imitates God. It's close, but it's always off just a little bit. Instead of being right on target where God is, it's off just a little bit. And he starts all these different religions, all these different denominations, and takes people further and further away from the truth, away from the Scripture, and away from him and away from heaven. Uh, I, uh, I know that we, get, we like to base our beliefs on what we experience, or what we feel, or what we've been been taught, but we have to go by what God says and not what anybody else has taught us, including me. If you don't believe what I've told you tonight, compare it with what the Bible says. And I point you to to some scriptures tonight. Check them out. Research it for yourself. And believe what God says, not what your church has taught you, not what your parents taught you, not what 
what you felt or what you liked or what you thought was a religious experience because you can be fooled. A lot of people are. In fact, according to Scripture, most people are. Few there be that find that narrow gate. Broad is the way that leads to destruction, and many there be that go in thereat. So don't be snookered, okay? I'm trying to give you the truth, but I'm also trying to point you to the truth. Go back to the book. Go back to the book. It's all there, okay? And it's impossible to cover this thoroughly in 20 minutes or 15 minutes tonight, uh, but there's a whole lot more, and I encourage you to research further on this subject because it does... It does uh, mislead a lot of people, and that's Satan's doing a good job of that. All right, we want to get ready for communion tonight. We want to prepare our hearts for what the Lord has for us. So I'm going to ask you to stand, and David's going to play some nice quiet music. This is a time of introspection when we ask the Lord to search our hearts to see if there's any problem between us and him that needs to be resolved, or if there's something between us and anybody else that needs to be resolved. So if you need to cross the aisle and make things right with somebody, this is the time to do that. If you need to talk to God the next few minutes and make things right there, this is the time to do that. And then we will have communion. Be seated as men come at this time. Okay, 1 Corinthians 11, the Apostle Paul is writing to the church at Corinth to uh, teach them about the Lord's Supper. Uh, The whole book of 1 Corinthians is written to correct a lot of problems in the church there, which is why 14 is there, correcting them on their practice of the the gift of tongues. And here in in chapter 11, they were misusing the Lord's Supper. Uh, They had what was called, I'm just using this as a teaching moment, (laughs) just, just a moment here, They were having what they called agape feasts. The word agape is a Greek word for love. Uh, Love feasts, where they would get together and have dinners, banquets, like we do here occasionally. Uh, And at the end of that love feast, which is similar to Passover, a full Passover meal, they would have communion. The problem was that there were some folks in the church who were better off than others. They had means, and so they would bring these nice, fancy dinners uh, and I don't know what they brought. I don't know what they, kind of food they had. Paul doesn't elaborate. And then there were other folks who didn't have much money, were very poor, and didn't have much, if anything, to eat at all, these, these feasts. It was like a potluck, but you brought your own food. Uh, and Paul says, this is not right. You know, some of you are just showing off with all these fancy meals that you've got, and the person across the table from you has nothing. So this is, this is not. It's, it's causing bad feelings um, among the people there. And there was a lot of issues with pride and flesh and other, other things in the church there. He said, you guys are, are abusing the Lord's table. You're not recognizing what it's all about. This is a memorial looking back at the body and blood of Jesus Christ that was sacrificed for us, for our sins, to make us brothers and sisters in Christ. We also look forward to celebrating this with him in heaven eventually. He said, that's what it's all about. You need to approach the table reverently. This is not a party. So he's This is why he's saying what he's saying here, verse 23. For I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread, food, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you, this do in remembrance of me. That's the purpose. After the same manner also he took the cup when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye, as oft as ye drink it, in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death till he come. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. What he's talking about there is he, when we have this time of introspection, like we did a few minutes ago, this is not uh, intended to get you perfect before God or with anybody else. That's not what he means by unworthy. What he means is don't come irreverently. We need to come for the right purpose. We need to approach the Lord's table, understanding what it's all about, and honoring him, remembering him, and looking forward to celebrating this again with him. 
That is what he's talking about. That's what he means by unworthily. But let a man or person examine himself and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. That's what this introspection time was all about just a moment ago. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily eateth and drinketh damnation. And that word is actually judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. So what he means is we need to understand what this represents. This, this bread does not actually become the body of Christ when we pray in just a moment. That's, it, that prayer doesn't change the chemical formula of this bread, okay? It does not become his body. This represents his broken body. That grape juice, and that's what it is. It's unfermented grape juice. We don't use fermented wine here. There's no uh, yeast in it to cause fermentation because that represents sin in Scripture. This represents his sinless, holy blood. It's not his blood. It doesn't become his blood when we pray over it. It represents his shed blood for us. So what Paul is saying is we need to discern the Lord's body. We need to understand what's going on here. For this cause, many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. What he means by this is that people in the church at Corinth were actually dying because they were not recognizing what the Lord's Supper was all about. That's why we come reverently for the right purpose with the right motive. For if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord that we should not be condemned with the world. And he goes on to say, Wherefore, my beloved brethren, when you come together to eat, tarry one for another. And if any man hunger, let him eat at home, that you come not together unto condemnation. And the rest will I set in order when I come. In other words, I've got more to say when I actually get there. But he's saying, you know, if, you, if you're coming to these dinners just to eat, just to, just to pork out, you know, uh, eat at home, okay? Don't cause a problem when you come to church. That's what this chapter is all about. Once in a great while, I cover this and, and, and talk about what, what this is all about. But uh, there are a couple of rules for communion that we believe the Bible teaches. Uh, different churches look at it different ways. There are three different views. One is anybody can take communion. And we don't believe that's scriptural. This is not for unsaved people. If there's not been a time and a place in your life when you've turned from your sin and trusted in Jesus Christ as your Savior, you should not approach the Lord's table because you haven't trusted in what this represents. Jesus died for your sin. He gave his body to be broken for you. He gave his blood to be shed for you. If you're not going to accept that, then don't accept this. The other opposite uh, extreme is only church members can take this. We don't believe that's scriptural either. There's nothing in Scripture that says you have to be a member of this church to take communion. There is a middle-middle position. It's called, it's not open communion like everybody can have it. It's not closed communion like only members can have it. It's close communion. That is, if you are saved and scripturally baptized, baptism is necessary because it's, it shows that you're obedient to him. It doesn't save you. It just shows that you're obedient. You're submissive to him. If you are saved and scripturally baptized, then you can take communion. You don't have to be a member of this church, okay? So I just wanted to uh, make that clear. And with that understanding, we can begin.
it's been our tradition for many years uh, at this point in the service to read the passage that is inscribed on the, on the front of the tablecloth here. It's, uh, I don't think it's the whole verse, but the, a portion of it. Revelation chapter 5, verse 9. I'm not sure what we did before we got this tablecloth, but, the, uh, but we, we always look at this verse and remember our missionaries at this time. The verse says this, and they, talking about us, we, and they sung a new song saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof, for thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation. The reason we read that at this point in the service is because we are about to drink the cup that represents Jesus' blood that was shed for us. And we also want to remember our missionaries because they are winning people to Christ all around the world. And those people that they win to Christ, no matter what nation or tongue or nationality, skin color, language, diet, customs, government, no matter what it is, they are our blood brothers and sisters in Christ by the same blood that saved us. And so we will be with them forever and eternity. We're looking forward to seeing them someday. Uh, we want to pray for the missionaries who are serving on various foreign, foreign fields. Normally, I try to mention one missionary when I do that. I don't really have anybody specific in mind, but I will mention the Ruescos. They're not in uh, Spain right now. They're not on the field. They're here. And the reason I'm mentioning them is because they were scheduled to come through here tomorrow night and have dinner with Gene and I. Um, They're just here to drop their uh, son off at Liberty University, uh, be starting college this year. But they all came down with COVID. So he uh, wrote to me the other day and said, uh, we're not going to be able to make dinner, and I'm grateful for that. <laughs> um, but uh, you might pray for the Ruizkas. I think they're doing okay, but they do need our prayers. They're still traveling um, going to be going west of the Mississippi, Mississippi for a little while before they go back to Spain. But uh, other than that, just pray for missionaries as the Lord lays them on your heart, if you would. Brother Irwin, again, I'm going to ask you to leave us in prayer and remember the Reyescas and the cup, please. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you so much for being the great and mighty God that you are. And thank you for your son, Jesus, who you sent down to die on the cross for our sin. And Lord, we thank you for your son and for what he did on that cross and for the blood that he shed, and for his body that was broken for us. And Lord, we thank you for being such a forgiving, loving, merciful, gracious God. And Lord, uh, the salvation that you give us through your son is something that we don't deserve, but you give it to us as, as a gift. And Lord, we pray that each and every person here that is taking this communion, that has, has taken that gift and has accepted their needs. And Lord, in this increasingly growing, dark, growing world, uh, we ask, Lord, that you continue to watch over them, and especially you lift up the ones there, the ones in Afghanistan as well. There are missionaries there that we ask that you protect them also. Uh, we especially want to lift up the Ruescas, uh, who are our, the missionaries in support for the crossroads to Spain, and Lord, we ask that you... Um, protect them, provide for them, and we ask the Lord for their healing as they are struggling with uh, the virus as well. And we pray, Lord, that you continue to provide support to them as they head back to Spain. And Lord, we thank you for this opportunity that we come, to, we get to come to your table, and we pray that your will be done in our lives. Lord, we love you so much, and we thank you in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, if you would, stand with me as we sing our closing hymn and head out into, well, it's not night. It's pretty out there, right? What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know 
Nothing but the blood of Jesus. And all God's people said, amen. Amen. Good night and God bless you.